My name is Greg. Um, I've had over eight years of SEO and PPC experience now. When I say SEO and PPC, do you guys know what those acronyms are actually talking about? So anyone here who doesn't, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization, and PPC stands for uh, Pay Per Click. So anytime you do a Google search, you see any ads at the very top of the page, those are those paid search listings. Now we're not gonna go over that today, we're just gonna do just organic. And that's really what SEO uh, stands for, Search Engine Optimization. Um, I run my own business. I've been in business now for three years, or actually approaching three years. Uh, my company is TM Blast. I'm a frequent speaker, I'm doing a presentation right now. And outside of work, I live in Charlestown with my fiance and our three-year-old, uh, well, I said two year here, but now it's actually approaching three, uh, Shiba Inu. <clears throat> so the question is, how can SEO grow my business? Now, before I get even further, is anyone here familiar with the HBO show called Silicon Valley? Okay, we got a couple of hands, good. Because there's a lot of pictures. So, I'm gonna demo off this website that I run. It's called the Stadium Reviews. And this is a WordPress website, mainly focused on parking, along also with the reviews too. But I'm gonna share some numbers before we go into some strategy, just so I can kind of give you guys an idea uh, what SEO can do for your business. So let's go over some numbers first. The main thing with SEO is you need to be technically sound. So there's plenty of tools out there that can actually give you an idea as to say how your score is from a uh, technical perspective. And technical SEO is so critical because if you want to rank on Google, Google needs to understand all of your content. So I, could, I have a picture right here from a tool called Sitebull. And Sitebull uh, runs for my site every week. And I have a pretty good score, 94% on an audit and a 98% on an SEO score specifically. What does that translate into? Well, this is from Google Analytics. This is my traffic for the entire year of 2019. This is a brand new website that I built out in, I think it was late February, so we're approaching already one year uh, of this new website. And as you can see, the traffic has been growing and then it finally had a big hockey stick effect in the month of December. Now, this is gonna surprise everyone here but Google makes up 64% of my traffic. Bing, Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo make up 35%. That will shock everyone, because show of hands here, who uses Bing? No one, okay, I do. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is actually, when a lot of people think of SEO, they only think of Google. They think, how do I rank on Google? How do I get the traffic? But you have to also remember that SEO is not geo. It's not Google engine optimization, it's search engine. So always consider that when you're trying to grow your traffic, that there's other sources too. And these are my numbers just to prove that. What are some of the uh, best listings that I have within Google? So I took, a, I took uh, two screenshots from two keywords. One is new airfield parking and the other is indoor baseball stadiums. So, are you guys familiar when you ever Google something like how to, how to bake salmon or what's the weather or how old is Tom Brady? You might get an answer here at the very top. This is actually the answer box. And this actually receives more clicks than the traditional listing. What's great is that you'll see here on the left hand side, I outrank the official Buffalo Bills website about their own parking. That's pretty impressive, right? I mean, this is an official National Football League run website, and my one-year-old blog is outranking them. And I'm gonna go over some tips of how you can do that for your site, for your company's site, and really how to grow that organic search traffic. So I wanted to kind of give that as a bit of a tease that it, it is not impossible if you do the right steps. Okay. So I think I got people's attention. This is real. We're gonna go over some real things. So how do I grow my traffic? I started from the beginning. Technical SEO needs to come first. This view here is from the tool Sitebull. 
And this tool visualizes a representation of how my website is broken down from an architectural standpoint. So when Google or Bing, DuckDuckGo come to my site as a crawler, they actually have a very clear path. When they start from my homepage, they can go anywhere and find all my content very easy. A lot of sites, though, you might see are not as clear. And you can imagine if it's not clear from a visual standpoint, it's not clear for a search engine either. So what do I mean by architecture? Architecture really means that if you're ever looking at a URL, you can actually remove one of the paths and you would know exactly where you are. So on my site, thestadiumreviews.com, if you remove the resources parking page and you just remove the word parking, you will get to the main resources page. And if you remove the resources slug, you get to my homepage. Pretty easy, but it's something that a lot of people overlook. The robots text file is actually the key to tell Google and Bing where they should and should not look on a website. You can go to any website on the web and write slash robots.txt. You will see their information. This here will say, if it's allow, it means I'm telling Google to crawl my JavaScript, to crawl my CSS files. If you write the word disallow, you tell them to not look at this folder path. Now, this is a pretty basic uh, robots text file. But if you're an e-commerce site that has thousands of URLs because if you click on red shoes and then you click on size eight and then they have to be for women and they have to be in the winter, you can have something with a query uh, URL. And that query can cause a lot of problems within Google because now they have to crawl every new version of a page. So you can actually disallow that within the robots.txt file to only crawl your main pages on your site. The final tip is that you should include an XML sitemap in your robots text file. Because from, an, uh, from a crawling perspective, Google and Bing will come to your robots text file first. And if you give them the path to see your XML sitemap, they'll be able to discover all of your pages on your site. So an XML sitemap is kind of like that legend key for a search engine to see all of your content, and also from a priority standpoint. So if you have very specific pages you want Google to crawl more often, you can actually prioritize those within the XML sitemap. So the priority of a one is saying from a Google perspective, if you can only crawl 20 pages, crawl this page. Don't worry about my random blog post from you know, many months ago that don't drive any traffic. Only focus on these pages. There's a free tool called Google Search Console. Uh, are you guys familiar with that tool, show of hands? Some people go, okay, a lot of people, okay. Uh, Google Search Console is great because it's gonna tell you how Google uh, crawls your site and the ranking keywords, the pages, any technical errors that are on your site. Now it's aggregated, so it will usually never match with Google Analytics, but this is a free tool that will actually give you your search query information. Now, show of hands again, who here uses Bing Webmaster Tools? <laughs> okay, well, I saw some hands, good. Well, Bing Webmaster Tools, remember what I said, 35% of my traffic comes from Bing, Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo. And by the way, when I mentioned DuckDuckGo, uh, Bing powers Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo, and AOL, and Ecosia, um, and I'm not sure about Ask, but it doesn't matter. The point, though, is that it actually powers more than just one search engine, but anyway, Bing Webmaster Tools will show you what Bing is crawling for your site. So again, the keywords, the pages, any technical errors that are on the site. One tip that I always mention is that you can export the keywords that you rank for in either search engine, and you can figure out where that gap is. So for example, if you're not driving any traffic from Bing or Yahoo, Take a look at this dashboard and figure out exactly why. Maybe, maybe these pages haven't even been crawled yet by Bing. And you can actually submit each page you want within the tool to tell Bing to crawl your pages right now. So this is kind of what I mentioned. In Bing Webmaster Tools and Google Search Console, you can, you can manually have their bot crawl your page. 
So what do I mean by that? And I'll move over here just because I realize I'm only on one side. So what I mean by that is you can actually have uh, a new blog post that you write and you spend, let's say, weeks or if not months writing this great piece of content. Now, if you launch it, um, you might actually have to wait a few weeks because Google won't even crawl that, that, new, pa uh, that new page that you just wrote. And if you spend all that time writing a great blog post, you should tell Google to immediately crawl it. Because if they crawl it, then you will rank. If they don't crawl it, you won't drive any traffic to it. So you should get in the habit of any new page that you write or that you publish, immediately fetch it within Google and Bing. It will speed up your keyword rankings and your traffic. OK. So now that this is a WordPress meetup, I figured I would share some plugins that can help your SEO. And I'm going to start off with insert headers and footers. So within Google Analytics, Search Console, Bing Webmaster Tools, they always tell you to put some code on the head version of your site. So if you're either very technically savvy, you can maybe go in and manually add that code. But there's a plugin here that you can actually just download, and you can paste in your code directly into your header, and you can click on Save. It will immediately verify uh, Google Analytics or any tracking script you want. Super easy to use. Uh, it works on most uh, themes. So definitely check that one out. 301 redirects. So how many times do you guys launch a WordPress site and it comes up with the default Hello World page? Well, anyway, you want to immediately redirect that because that page is so useless. So I use this plugin called 301 redirects. And the 301 redirect is you telling Google to say, this page is actually this page over here. So you can, you can redirect as many pages as you want. Uh, but then the 301 redirect plugin, again, 301 is a permanent redirect, uh, and it's just super easy to use within the plugin. Now, a show of hands here, who uses the plugin Yoast? Yes, that's what I thought. Uh, Yoast is super easy. If no one here uses it, uh, it allows you to optimize your title tags. Think of your title tag as the chapter name of your book. So if you're writing this great book, which is your website, the title tag is that specific section, uh, uh, that chapter in, within your book. So here's my example of the Barclays Center. This is a, a uh, uh, was it basketball arena out in Brooklyn. And you can write the title tag at the very top, so it says Barclay Center Parking and Brooklyn Nets Parking. That's actually what users will see when they Google or Bing a search query around Barclay Center Parking. So you want to make it enticing. You want to make it interesting enough that they know exactly what this page will be when they click on it. You can do that all within Yoast. Yoast will also create an XML sitemap for you, so you don't have to worry about creating your own. It will handle that. It will also handle a canonical tag for you as well. I'm not going to get too specific into what that means, but Yoast will handle a lot of technical um, implementation in the background, uh, so it's just really easy to uh, get ahead with SEO. The last plugin that I'm going to mention is the plugin Smoosh. So, a lot of times, you might have a great picture that you took on your iPhone, maybe on your DSLR camera, and you immediately upload it into your CMS, your WordPress, and you put it on the page. Now, obviously, from a browser perspective, Google Chrome, they're going to minify that, that image to actually look good for a mobile device or on your tablet or on your desktop computer. But if you don't manually minimize that file, that's going to be a much larger fi uh, file size for now your browser to compress. And that's actually going to take longer now to load. So if you use this plugin called Smoosh, you can actually manually, well, not manually, but it automatically minify all of your images on your site at once, which is great. Because if you have hundreds of pages, you, you can imagine how long that would take to minify each picture on every page. This plugin will do them all at once. So uh, definitely go through that. This is actually my favorite part to go over. It's the secret SEO tips. And if you ever heard the expression, 
secret sauce or from an SEO perspective. No one ever gives away their tips, but today it's going to be different. I'm going to share some really good tips for you guys to implement on your website. But of course, before we start, it's important to share some results. So, I do consulting for the last three years of my business at TM Blast, and I've redacted this key keyword report for one of my clients. But they went from position nine of Google, so very on the very bottom of page one, to now the top listing as position one within Google. This keyword costs $12 if they were running ads for it. So that means that every time somebody would click on that listing, it would cost them $12. But they're not, because there's no ads. They're ranking first within Google, so they're actually saving money per month. And you can see from a visual standpoint for this one keyword alone, a thousand percent increase in traffic just from this one word moving from position nine to position one. So from a cost savings perspective, from, uh, from a conversion perspective, this was a very valuable uh, term for my client to get to position one and it really allowed them now to open up their marketing budget for LinkedIn ads or other platforms too that they had to originally invest within Google ads. Uh, so it really allowed to create that uh, larger marketing funnel for them. Now this is a very hard slide to read and I apologize, but this, these are actually the steps that I took to rank them at position one. So if you guys want to take a photo of this, I think this will actually be pretty helpful. Um, and a lot of this you'll see is actually what I just went over. So we started off with the robots text file. My client did not have that. So we created that. We created the rules. We created the XML sitemap directly into the robots text file. Um, there was no canonical tags uh, on their pages. Now, if you're using Yoast, you don't have to worry about that, but they didn't have that. Um, you can also see there's some other issues on the page as well, but the steps that I took were the steps that I outlined originally in this presentation. And this is a timeline of everything that I implemented for them. So you can see Google Search Console was created, Bing Webmaster Tools was submitted, um, the robots X file was created, all that kind of stuff. So from a visual standpoint, we started the contract on November 27th, and I gave a snapshot of every single optimization that I did to get them to position one within Google. So we're gonna go over some extra SEO tools that I think you guys can find very valuable to grow your traffic for your website. A show of hands here, how many of you guys use the tool Google Trends? Okay, so a few people. So it sounds like maybe some of you guys are not too familiar with this tool. Google Trends is a free tool. Anyone can use it if you have a Gmail account. And this is gonna show you from a search uh, interest level for any keyword um, or any topic that you're searching for. So for example, how many of you watched the Super Bowl that happened a few weeks ago? Some people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I thought everyone would raise their hand. Okay, good. Well, anyway, long story short, though, if you went to Google Trends and you searched for Shakira or Jennifer Lopez, you would have seen in the last five years that searches in Google for Shakira or Jennifer Lopez was relatively low. There wasn't any new music, or if there was, there wasn't any like, real significant interest. But the moment they did the Super Bowl performance, it shot up to 100. And the 100 does not represent 100 searches, but it shows demand. So if you're covering a topic that has consistent demand, you know you're actually writing for a really good audience. And I share this because of my website, The Stadium Reviews. I cover baseball parking, hockey parking, basketball, and football. Football parking in green is actually the most searched out of all the major sports for parking, and it's consistent every single year. So when I write about this topic, I know from my own and from a monetization standpoint that every September, October, November, December, and January for the Super Bowl are gonna be very lucrative months because I can tell for the last five years that this trend is not going down. In fact, football seems to only gain more and more um, uh, 
more in demand where fans actually watch games, whereas baseball is kind of losing some attendance. But the point, though, is that you can use this for any topic. And the reason why I share this is that you might be going after keywords that are losing search interest. So if you ever wanted to blog about something or talk about something in general, throw the keyword into Google Trends and go for the past five years, um, if you can, and see if there's been a growth for five years or if this has been on a decline. Because if you're writing on a decline topic, you might be getting less and less uh, clicks each year, and you're not too sure why if your rankings are still position one. There's a tool I use called SEM Rush. Now, this is a this tool costs money. It's about hundred dollars a month. And if you're interested, I did share within the Boston uh, Meetup on, on, uh, on Meetup.com a free 14-day trial to this tool. So definitely take advantage of that. Run some reports. And the report that I run for all of my pages and even for my clients is the content analyzer section. Now, what this tool is going to do is that you can paste in the content on your site for the keyword you want to rank for. And when you paste it into SEM Brush, it's going to give you a score. So here's an example that the content that I pasted in has an 8.8 out of 10. And if you paste in your content you want to rank for, you might actually get a higher score or a lower score. But if you have a low score, that tells you you have more opportunity to re-optimize that page. So what do I mean by re-optimize? So this is redacted, but I'll just tell you exactly what this keyword was. This was around Angel Stadium parking. And when you write about Angel Stadium parking, it's easy from an SEO perspective to keep repeating that phrase 10 times on a page, maybe 20. But that's actually not how search engines work anymore. What the, how they're going to work is they, they need to find related words on the page. That's why Wikipedia is always ranking first, or usually at the top for thousands, if not thousands, of more words. So the words that are closely associated to something like uh, Angels Parking are things like Los Angeles, Major League Baseball, Street Parking, uh, Angels Tickets, popular matches, so that includes the LA Dodgers, the New York Yankees. Um, they also go over uh, popular bars as well. So this tool actually allows you to encompass a topic in more ways than just simply saying this is Angel Stadium Parking. You can, you can actually have a comprehensive page that covers a topic in much greater detail. If you guys ever go to Google and you search for something like Fenway Park Parking, you might see people also ask below that. So people might be asking, is there street parking in Boston? Um, what time do the gates open before first pitch? How much are the parking lots? Um, how long can I leave my car in the parking lots after a game? And if you click into any of those people also ask, there are usually different sites ranking. So that tells me that Google is saying that there isn't one site covering this topic in such a great way that they have to show multiple different sites that sort of cover this topic. And from a consumer standpoint, that's a little difficult because now I have to go to different pages to find different information. So this tool from SDM Rush can actually tell you all the words you need to put on your page and how to break them out so you can actually rank for your primary keyword like Angel Stadium Parking. This tool costs money now, unfortunately. It was free when I gave this presentation a year ago, but it's called Keywords Everywhere. And the way it works is that when you install for Google Chrome or Firefox, you do any Google search or any Bing search or any YouTube search, um, and it will give you the search volume directly into uh, the Google listing. So for example, if I ever do a Google search for Angel Stadium Parking just in Google, I'm going to see that there's 6,000 searches each month for that phrase. I know that that is a strong topic for me to cover because there's high demand, there's a lot of searches each month, and I know if I get to page one of Google, I'm going to drive traffic to my site. So if you guys don't want to invest in SEM Rush or Moz or Ahrefs or all these other sites that cost $100 a month, you can buy keywords everywhere and you can get maybe, I think it's like 10,000 queries you can do for about $100 and you can get all the search volume right there. So it's directly into a Google search. Does anyone here, from a show of hands, ever use the website Answer the Public? One person, yes. Okay, 
This is great. Now, you're looking at the site and you're like, what is this site right here? Well, it's actually, it's a site that aggregates all the questions that people search for for any topic. So there is a free version, but that you can also pay to get more data too. So how does this look? So if you put in any uh, search query, so I did one for women's boots, here are all the topics that I could write about, about this one topic about women's boots. This tool is pulling from an aggregate of multiple sources of how people are searching for what, where, why, how, etc. Now, if you're ever in a, in, in, if you're ever writing about a topic and you're like, I have no idea what to write about, or maybe I wrote about everything, I challenge you to go into answer the public and put the keyword that you want to rank for or that you talk about in general and find a new blog post because you already know that these are emerging topics that people are searching for. Some of the best content to actually write about on your own site is whenever you see Quora or Yahoo Answers um, in Google search results because, or even Reddit because that tells me that people are searching for a topic because they could not find the answer uh, from a traditional Google search, so they had to go on Quora and ask a question. If you can write about that on your own blog post, you're already gonna drive more traffic because you know that there's demand. Okay, now we're, we're approaching the end of the presentation, so I'm gonna give over one more tip. So the low search volume topic, so some people say, uh, what I write about doesn't have a lot of searches each month. How much traffic can I really drive uh, for, my, for my niche topic? So taking an example from SEM Rush, I'm gonna take uh, a query for, that only has about 10 searches a month. So I'm gonna take this query right here. It says best vitamins for uh, growth women. It only has 10 searches a month. So you might say, is this even worth for me to write about if only 10 people are searching for it? So I go into Google and I'm gonna take the very first organic listing, this answer box right here. I clicked into it and I copied the URL and I put it into SEM Rush. This page gets 27,000 visits each month, but I specifically only search for that one phrase that only had 10 searches a month, and that tells me that there's a lot of interest in this topic outside of just one keyword. So what does that look like? If you open up an SEM rush, the keywords that this page ranks for, if I search for vitamins and best, I'm gonna take best vitamins for hair growth, this has 12,000 searches each month. And if I'm asking myself, what can I do to write more content around this topic? I'm gonna go back to answer the public, paste this phrase in, and here's everything that I can write about. All right here, you can export this. What's great too, is that if you use answer the public, you can export all of these phrases and it'll actually give you the search volume for each one. So if you had a content team and you want to do from the highest to lowest search volume, you can export this entire list and it'll come into an Excel format with the search volume for each of these phrases so you can then sort it after that. And you know exactly any topic you write about is gonna have a lot of search volume. And that's it, thanks everyone. So I can, I can open this up for, uh, for any questions, if anyone has, uh, yes. Um, earlier, uh, you mentioned that um, anyone can write about any page, but also could there be any post crawled by Google search engine? Not only a page, but can also a post be crawled? Are you referring to uh, a post within WordPress, like a blog post compared to a page? Yeah. Yeah. Like you were mentioning, the moment you write a page, ask Google Search Console to call it. But um, my question is, can it also be a post and not a page? The, yeah, the question is, um, whatever you write, whether it's a page or a post within WordPress, can you fetch it? Yes, you can. You can fetch anything you want. You can do your homepage, you can do a blog post, you can do a page in general. Um, 
the way it works is that if you ever do log file analysis of any website, you'll notice that Google does not crawl your main pages every single day. In fact, think of it like a salt timer, where if you flip it over, Google might only have 20 seconds to crawl as many pages as they can, and then they have to leave. So if you were saying, hey, today, Google, you need to crawl these main pages on my site, um, you're going to have a much better chance to rank that content up higher within Google because maybe that page you want them to crawl is your most important page. Maybe it's like your main service or maybe it's a blog post you spend weeks writing and you want to rank really well within Google. So again, the habit of manually fetching that within Google and Bing, that's a great question. Yep. Uh, was there a big change in like January 15th or 16th? I saw something weird go on with Google. Yeah. It seems to push all of my competitors up into like until even. Yeah, the, the question's about um, Google algorithm updates. So does anyone here use a tool um, either like Mozcast or do you ever go on SEO Roundtable or Search Engine Land or any of these other publications sometimes? Uh, so SEO Roundtable is pretty good. They're going to document any big Google algorithm update. So if you're ever like, wait, why did my traffic drop? Um, you can actually go to SEO Roundtable and it will tell you if there's any big algorithm updates. Now, I'll address this question because I think it's a really good one. Google does algorithm updates all the time. Um, sometimes you'll see sites randomly drop, some sites will randomly gain, and it all seems kind of just completely bonkers at times because your traffic's going all over the place. From my experience, the sites that lose the traffic are the sites that are trying to gain the system. So if you are buying links, if you are stealing other people's content, if you're putting white text on a white background to try to you know, gain the search engines, um, every time there's a big algorithm update, those are actually usually the sites that can completely drop off. So if you're trying to grow your traffic, definitely stay away from any of those packages that say, for $200, we'll build you 500 links because the links can help you rank. Um, if you actually notice in my presentation, I never went over links. Links do matter, but links can come from a natural linking strategy anyway. So if I write a great piece of content, sometimes my post watch get uh, put onto Reddit. And uh, from Reddit, uh, it's a no-follow link, so it doesn't pass any SEO value back to my site, but I get a lot of referral traffic. Um, and Google's going to look at that and say, uh, this person's site that ranks uh, for this topic is now being shared organically on Reddit, on Quora, on Yahoo Answers, etc. These links maybe don't count from an SEO standpoint, but there's a lot of great value. And they can actually see those links because they can find out that people are, are navigating to Reddit, they're clicking on the link to come into this page. And actually what's most important is that they're probably not going back to Google to search for that phrase because the content that they found answered all their questions. So, very good question. Yes? Uh, do you have any opinion, excuse me, on um, Uber Suggest? Ooh. Yeah, the question was around another tool called Uber Suggest from Zanil Patel, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. Uber Suggest is going to tell you, again, some emerging topics to, to cover. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's a great tool. I think there's so many tools that you can kind of combine together. Uh, that will kind of give you ideas for more queries to either write about or include on your page. Um, one tool that I didn't include in this presentation because it costs $350 a month, but it's called ClearScope. And ClearScope is going to break down in a really easy uh, way of what content you should include on your page. So I'm working with one of my friends, he's a realtor out in uh, Denver, Colorado. And he's really excited. He just launched his website over the weekend. And we threw his content into ClearScope, and he has an F, uh, which means uh, he didn't include any of the relevant phrases on the page. And what's funny is that the, this tool from ClearScope will actually show him all the words that he was missing. So words like realtor, real estate, new home, um, uh, uh, Denver realtor, uh, et cetera. It looks so obvious when you use the tool, but when you're writing content, you have no idea of all the phrases that you should include on your page. So I mentioned ClearScope because it costs $350 a month, but you can actually go to their site, 
You can mention that you heard of ClearScope from a presentation. You can demand a free trial, and they'll actually give it to you. Um, that's actually how I got into their tool. I just lied and said, I heard about you guys in a presentation, and then they gave it to me for free. Uh, and they gave me about 10 reports to run. So definitely take advantage of that. It's a great way to run your content uh, through the tool for free. And you don't have to pay. Um, but yeah, just like Uber suggests, just another, another great tool. What happens to these free trials after 14 days? I mean, are you leaving something behind in terms of privacy, or are they free trials? You've got one too. The free trial, so from an SDM brush perspective, they will probably have your email address for sure, whatever you sign up with. Um, the way SDM Rush really works in its best way is that you can run a project dashboard. You can track your keywords on a daily basis. You can run weekly health reports too. So if you're ever considering, I want to know my keyword rankings and I want to see growth, and I'll go back a few slides just to kind of illustrate that. Uh, let me go back a few. This one right here. This is a project dashboard within SEM Rush, and I track my, all my client keywords within here. It tracks every day, it updates every 24 hours. And it's, if you're using a tool like SEM Rush or Moz or, or any other keyword tracking tool, um, it will actually tell you if you're moving up into page one or not. Because what I've noticed is that a lot of people will work on their SEO, and then they'll get discouraged, and then they'll quit. And they quit because they don't get any of the traffic. But you don't get the traffic because you're not on page one yet. But if you can see from a visual standpoint that you move from page eight to page five to then page three, that should give you the encouragement that everything you're doing is right. You just gotta give it a little bit of time for Google to rank your content. So if you ever had a project dashboard after 14 days and then you didn't sign up for uh, the trial, it's just more that any of the progress that you were just tracking that you lose. So. It's kind of just your decision. If you want to, you know, track your keywords and see your progress and use the content checker, and then you can even write notes within the tool and say, I updated my content on this day, and I noticed this hockey stick effect. Um, it's just a great way for documentation. Um, but it's a great question. Okay, I would think of that. Just like you were coming up about writing for featured snippets. So any, any, any clues on how to do that correctly? Because that's what you really did there, right? Yeah, the, the question was around, and let me just make sure I'm showing the right slide. We popped up a couple of times, and they were very powerful. There is absolutely no question. Yeah. Were, were you referring to this? Yeah. I love this slide, by the way. I take great pride that I outrank the Buffalo Bills. I think that's so funny, and I still do. Um, but anyway, uh, so how, how do you get an answer how do you get an answer box like this? Um, you'll Actually, you'll see what's really interesting is that the picture on the left-hand side for new airfield parking, that's actually not my picture. They took it from a different source because Google is trying to show the best results in their results. So they know that from a, a picture standpoint, another site has a better map of the parking situation at new airfield, but my content actually answers the question in a much better way. Um, how you get into the answer box, and I'll pull up my site just to kind of show you what this looks like, because I think this is a, uh, a very good question. So let me go to Google real quick. So this is my site. So when you land on this page, it starts off with the H1 tag, new error field parking. You'll see that I ask the question, how much is Buffalo Bills parking as my header to tag? The reason why I got that is because I used answer the public. Answer the public told me that if I want to ring for the phrase Buffalo Bills parking or new error field parking, a trending question that people are searching for is the word, or the phrase simply, how much is Buffalo Bills parking? So if you, if you ask the question in your content, 
You put a question mark, you tag it as an H2. Google took this entire thing, this if you plan, you know, to park in the new airfield, blah, blah, blah. That's actually how they got me into the answer box. I asked the question within my content, and then I used a, a two or three sentence uh, answer at the bottom, and then they took all that. So if you look at the rest of this page, I ask a lot of questions. Can you tailgate at the stadium parking lots? Should I take public transportation? What are the popular matches for the Buffalo Bills, etc.? My topic is about new era field parking, but I ask and I answer all of these questions because I know from an answer the public uh, standpoint, these are the trending questions that people have. And you can imagine that if you're out in the Buffalo, New York area, and you're going to a Bills game, you're gonna ask these questions yourself. What time did the lots open? What are the rules for tailgating? Can I even tailgate uh, before a game? Some football stadiums actually don't allow tailgating, surprisingly. But the Buffalo Bills, you absolutely can. But, <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, and but also the question too, like, should I take public transportation? And the reason why I'm showing my site is that my goal is for you to click on an ad or to buy parking right here. Obviously, there's no football games going on. You got a Rolling Stones concert happening, you know, over the summer. So not a lot of traffic coming to this page. But even though my goal is for you to buy parking from Spot Hero or to click on one of those ads, um, I know from a consumer standpoint that I should get the best experience when you come to my site no matter what you're looking for. So even if you're not gonna buy parking, you're just curious of what the deal is, where to park, what the lots are, what the handicap lots are, et cetera. I'm gonna cover all of those topics on my page, but again, I chose those questions from Answer the Public. So I ask it as an H2 tag, and then I answer the content directly below that. It's a great question. So, quick follow-up on the, the actual snippet, that slide that you have. Yeah. Is the, the, what's the response there, the Google response, is that verbatim what you put into the snippet editor? Are you referring to uh, this? Yes. Yeah. Is, is that you or? This is me. Verbatim. Mm -hmm. So if you ever use uh, Google Assistant or, well, I don't know, let's, let's just keep it to Google Assistant for right now. If you ever did a voice search on your Android phone, um, it would actually pull up my information right up here and it would read it off to you word for word. So whenever you're gonna write for voice queries or even just for answer boxes in general, write it so it makes sense. So anyone that looks at this right here knows exactly if you plan to park in new airfield parking lots, you can expect to pay and then it goes with all the information. That tells you everything that you need to know. Google's very confident that um, my site actually answers this question really well. And again, I love how it outranks the Buffalo Bills' own website because they never answer these questions. So that's right, that's great. It is, yeah, it's awesome. And, but again, so but I use Answer the Public to validate that these were questions people were searching for. Because again, if the buffalobills.com was not answering these questions, people were probably going on Reddit or using Twitter or whatever asking, hey, uh, when do these lots open? Or roughly how much do these parking spaces cost? So if you can answer all these questions on your page, Google's gonna reward you. And that's actually why they reward Wikipedia so many times. So you didn't add any Google schema on that page? No schema, great question. I did not add any Google schema. There's no code about um, any featured snippets. Um, this is just me doing an H2 tag with a question and then answering the content directly below that. And I did manually fetch the page multiple times, uh, especially in the football season, because I, I kept telling Google, crawl my content. I think I have the best content for this phrase, new era field parking. Um, I didn't share this, but it's in my Google Analytics. This was actually my best page for traffic. Even though football season's only three months, give or take if the Bills make the playoffs, um, which they usually don't. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
but they did it, I think, actually this year, but whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, the point, though, is that this phrase just had so much search demand from September, October, and November, uh, especially. So I, from my end, I manually fetched my football pages all throughout the football season, and I didn't touch my baseball pages because once the World Series ended, nobody really cared about Fenway Park parking anymore. So that's why I always change my, uh, my, my fetching because I want to make sure that my best pages with the most interest, according to Google Trends, are the ones being crawled by Google. Do you do that in the site, your, your site map? Is that how you it's a great, it's a great question. Um, the question was, do I update this within my XML sitemap? I do. Great question. Uh, no one's ever asked that before. So I mentioned earlier that you can, in your XML sitemap, you can change the priority of your pages, and that tells Google and Bing to crawl certain pages more often. Now, I do log file analysis so I can confirm the fact that if you change the priority, Google will crawl these pages more often, but I still am in the habit of manually fetching a few of these pages every single day. And from a football perspective, I just knew that um, every Sunday that the Bills were going to have a football game, I would crawl my site manually on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, and on Sunday. And when they had an off week or they were away, I would crawl another team's parking page because uh, if the Bills were not playing at home, nobody was going to search for that that week. So I, it was very seasonal for how I was uh, changing my site map and manually fetching pages. You mentioned H2 tags. How important are they? What are they? Great question. Uh, the question was, what are H2 tags? Why are they important? Now, an H1 tag, and I'll uh, pull this open real quick. In WordPress, whenever you're writing a page or a blog post by default with Yoast, the title of your page is your H1 tag. Now, the H1 tag tells Google and Bing that this phrase is actually very important on the page. If you simply just bolded the phrase at the top from a, a, a search bot perspective, they're going to think that's just bolded. They're not actually quite sure why it's bolded, but they're not going to give as much emphasis to it. The H1 tag tells uh, Google and Bing that this phrase here is very important to this page. The H2 tag is right below, sorry, the H2 tag is one level down from your H1. So you'll see right here that I'm trying to rank for the phrase new error field parking. That's my H1, that's where the most search volume is. But how much is Buffalo Bills with parking? That's my H2 tag. They look similar from a user perspective, from, but from a bot perspective, my emphasis is on the new error field parking as the H1. The H2 tag, though, is simply saying that this is important, but it's not really the main thing on my page. So if you ever Google how to bake salmon, pretty much that question, how to bake salmon, is the H1. But anytime they're like, preheat the oven to 350, and then uh, put it in for 20 minutes, and all this other kind of stuff, those are usually H2 tags, because they answer the question right there. And whenever you go to a, a food blog, there's like all these stories that like the cooker, uh, like like the the uh, like the chef talks about. They're like, you know, like my grandmother taught me this recipe, blah blah blah. There's like so much detail, and you're like, just give me the answer, and like you'll scroll down, and then you'll find it because like you'll find it, uh, the the header tags on the page. But they actually put all that information in there because they're trying to rank uh, for that topic, so they're including so much additional information um, into the, into their posts. But uh, great question. Oh wait, how are we uh, doing the time? Are we good? We're at one or two more. Okay. Yes? SEO seems pretty time intensive, and in order to establish a blog, should more a successful blog, should more time almost be devoted to the SEO versus the writing? So how much time is one to devote to SEO? What percentage of the this is, a, this, is a, this is a great question. You know, like the time breakdown of SEO and just managing the blog in general. There's so many things you could do. You could be, you know, taking pictures or you could be um, drawing, whatever you have on your site. 
I think you should just do SEO while you're writing your content. And that's why I gave the example of SEM Rush before. So if you were going to rank for the term new error field parking, you would put that into SEM Rush and you would write your content in there first. Because if you write your content in there first, you already know you're including the right words on your page. So when you publish the content, you don't need to do your SEO again. My friend out in Colorado did it the opposite way. <laughs> he wrote all his content. He spent like weeks writing this thing. And he launched his site. And we threw it into SEM Rush and also Clear Scope, and he got an F. And the highest score you can get is an A++. So from an SEO perspective, he has no chance to rank for a Colorado realtor or a Colorado real estate agent. Um, so it's discouraging that he wrote all that content, he spent all that time writing, and when he launched his page, it was never, it was never gonna rank. So I always recommend to use a tool like SEM Rush or to get ClearScope for free. Um, and write your content in there first. It will save you so much time because if you have to backtrack and do everything now again, you're just going to get discouraged. It's a great question. Okay. Oh, one more. Yes. Yeah. So in the, um, Google indexes HTML first, and then they'll do a second pass on dynamic content. Is there a way to force it to when you if you submit a page, yeah. does it search both HTML and dynamic content? You end the night with a very complicated question, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to answer it. This is very good. So the question is, when Google comes to a page, um, they will crawl the HTML content, but you might also have a lot of JavaScript on your page, too. Um, the answer, well, I'll answer it in Google first, and I'll answer, I'll answer it in Bing, because I used to work at Bing. So I, I can answer part of this question. Uh, from Google, they, from a resourcing standpoint, they need to crawl a page as HTML first because it's from a resourcing, it's from a bandwidth perspective. The web has gotten so much larger with um, JavaScript and all these complicated ways to code a page. So Google is going to crawl a site first, crawl the HTML, and then come back at a later time and crawl the JavaScript. So the question is, how do I speed up the process to have Google crawl everything first? Um, right now, they're really just focused on the HTML. There's no real trick. You can have them say, crawl all the variations. Um, if you have a very heavy JavaScript website, so if you're pulling in all this uh, like content from a, a, a different resource, it's super intensive. Google probably can't um, you know, crawl that content immediately. So my suggestion is to put your HTML higher up on the page. Because from a bandwidth and resource perspective, Google's going to be able to crawl more of the content at the top before they get down to the bottom of the page. Um, and Bing is working on that too. Uh, they're not as advanced as Google. So if your site is very heavy into JavaScript, you might notice your Bing rankings are not as strong as Google. And that's just because their crawler takes multiple visits to actually decipher a page. So you should use Bing Webmaster Tools to manually fetch the page multiple times because it's going to take Bing more attempts to actually understand a page fully. So if your traffic is very low within Bing, get in the habit of crawling that page maybe two times as often uh, as Google Search Console because it takes their bot um, more time to understand a page fully. And that's a, a great question to end the presentation, so I thank you. Um, and that's it. So thank you.